Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the daily chart of first majestic silver over the top of the silver price. And we pointed out in the past that first majestic and silver have been for, for a long time fairly tightly correlated. You can see and they both made that bottom uh, just in the beginning of the year. Now, first majestic just took off to the upside. Silver went with it but then silver had a correction and first majestic just kept going um, tremendous move now if you remember i warned that if we didn't get some follow through on the upside i was projecting say 26 at least a test of 26 on silver if we didn't get that then we were going to see a crash in this stock and that's exactly what we're seeing we've seen about a 50 percent correction in the price of the stock and it looks to me like it's probably going lower. I don't see any volume to indicate that we have that volume type of bottom. Uh, the support is somewhere down around in here, maybe around nine or ten dollars. So if we get that price, are we going to get a lower silver price? Probably. We'll probably get a breakdown below this area here. That's going to be good for stackers. It's not going to be good for the people who bought into this first majestic I'm not going to call this a pump and dump but it, it, it's starting to look like that now let me show you this information from the Silver Institute this is uh, just the latest from them for the year 2015 and their supply and demand figures now the, the thing I want you to keep an eye on here there's a lot to look at here but just Tonight I'm just going to concentrate on the amount mined and the price. So you can see this bottom column here is the average silver price per ounce for that year. Now the high we reached was 2011 at $35, but you can see that 2012 came in fairly close with $31. Big drop in 2013 to $24 and then $20 in 2014. Average price for silver in the year 2015, $15.68. Now, that's more than cut in half from the average price of 2011. And uh, so the question one would ask is, why is that not reflected in the amount of silver mined? In other words, if silver is being mined for a profit, then you would think that people would cut back if they're not making a profit that's not what has happened you can see the mine production coming in at 886 that's the highest we've ever had so 2015 was the highest silver mine production with one of the lowest prices in a very long time how is that possible for at least 50 percent of the silver that's mined has nothing to do with the price well we've already talked about how it can be mined as a byproduct I think there's probably something more nefarious there as well. But the big question is, is how can a company be profitable if it's mining something uh, that is so cheap, it can't sell it for any amount of money, and yet the amount of uh, that product being mined is continuously rising? Well, obviously, in my mind, it can't. And so I've said for the longest time that that the silver miners and the gold miners, any of the miners, they, there's no way they can really be a fundamental buy until the manipulation ends. It just doesn't make any sense. It's the worst possible investment. Now that doesn't mean there can't be these speculative blowoffs, and I really do believe that this was a speculative move. I don't think that this was based on any fundamentals. I think that this was based on a bet by a lot of people who were thinking that finally the short term, medium term, whatever you want to call it, bear market in silver was finally over and we were going to get a big move. That didn't happen. So going out to the weekly, you can see silver seems to be rolling over. Clearly, First Majestic is uh, plummeting. We don't know how far it can plummet, but my best guess is going to be 10 or 9. So let's get to the debt to the penny. I want to cover this because I always cover the real amount of money that's being accumulated. We know the fiscal year ended the 30th of September. We're going to see that in an article here on Zero Hedge from Simon Black. And it's encouraging to see somebody besides myself 
actually calculate the debt the way it really should be calculated, which is how much debt did we add from day one of fiscal year of last year to the last day of the fiscal year. Well, you can see 18,150 and 19,573. And that 19,573, that's the highest number we've ever printed. So that's $1.4 trillion plus added to the national debt in the last fiscal year, which just ended the 30th of September. What does that mean? It means that they're just continuing to pile on debt. They're piling on the debt still, endless debt. So let's read this from Simon Black. The United States government closed out the 2016 fiscal year that ended a few days ago on Friday, September 30th with a debt level of $19.573 trillion. That's an increase of $1.422 trillion over the last year's fiscal close. That debt growth amounts to roughly 7.5% of the entire U.S. economy. By comparison, the Marshall Plan, which completely rebuilt Western Europe after World War II, cost $12 billion back in 1948, or roughly 4.3% of U.S. GDP at the time. The initial appropriation for the WPA, perhaps the largest Roosevelt New Deal make-work programs that employed millions of people, cost 6.7% of GDP, and more recently, the U.S. $700 billion bank bailout at the beginning of 2008 financial crisis was equivalent of 4.8% of GDP. So basically, these people managed to increase the national debt by a bigger percentage than the cost of the New Deal, Marshall Plan, and 2008 bank bailout. What exactly did you get for that money? Did they spend the $1.4 trillion on achieving world peace, eradicating poverty, saving the planet, or some other pipe dream? Did they finally fix America's crumbling infrastructure that has been in desperate need of repair? Did they send a gigantic tax refund check to every man, woman, and child in the country? Actually, the answer is D. None of the above. They squandered it all. In fact, the 2016 fiscal year had the third largest increase in U.S. government debt in U.S. history. The only two previous times in which the debt increased more than the 2016 fiscal year were during the financial crisis. But there was no financial crisis in 2016. The government didn't have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to bail out the banks. All things considered, 2016 was a pretty normal fiscal year for the federal government. There were no major emergencies to drain taxpayer funds, yet they still managed to blow $1.4 trillion because this level of waste and spending is now baked into the system. Even if they dramatically slashed spending and got rid of entire departments of the federal government, they would still be hemorrhaging cash at a rate far greater than the economy can now possibly grow. Social Security and Medicare are now the largest parts of the financial sinkhole, and according to their own projections, their drain on the budget is growing each year. All other government spending combined pales in comparison to Social Security and Medicare. So if you add up military spending, Homeland Security, National Parks, President Obama's jet, it's just a fraction of what they spend on Social Security and Medicare. These programs consume the vast majority of U.S. tax revenue, forcing the government to borrow mind-boggling amounts of money to fund its operations, even in good times. Just imagine how much debt will grow when, they, when times get tough again. What's even more crazy is that Social Security and Medicare aren't even properly funded. Both are rapidly running out of money. The program's annual trustee reports shows that their primary trust funds will be completely depleted starting in the next few years. In fact, one of Social Security's major trust funds for disability insurance was actually fully depleted last year. So even though these programs are already draining taxpayer resources by forcing the government to take on more and more debt, they are in need of a huge bailout. This leaves precisely one option, default. But on whom? It's possible the government could try to borrow the $42 trillion that they calculate is necessary to make these programs solvent again. That seems extraordinarily unlikely. But even if it were possible to print or, and or borrow that much money, it would either create a terminal currency crisis or force the U.S. government to default on unaffordable interest payments, throwing the financial system into chaos. 
The other option is to simply default on the future beneficiaries of these programs, telling people, hey, sorry, we wasted all of your money and there's nothing left. So their choice comes down to either screwing the banks or screwing the taxpayer. I wonder which option they'll pick. So uh, great analysis from Simon Black. That's exactly the situation that we're in. But it's not just us. I want you to look at this chart here. This is a chart of the Vancouver real estate market. And you can see that it is uh, broken down into detached condominium attached and apartments. Uh, but this this blue line here, that's going to be the housing. Uh, that is absolutely incredible. Uh, you've moved from a price of about 200 in 1988, really 100 a few years before that, all the way up to 1800. So over the course of those years, an 18-fold move, over the course of just since 2001, a four-fold plus move. And what's even more amazing about this chart is that this area here, which was the financial crisis, is really just a blip on the radar screen. You can see that since the financial crisis, uh, the recovery from that began, the housing prices in Vancouver have more than doubled. So I covered many times this type of chart shape. Uh, this is a parabolic chart. There's no question it can go up further. It was parabolic even back in here, but it will end in a crash. Parabolic charts always end in a crash. That's 99.999% of the time. The only exception to that would be, say, when we're talking about a currency, like uh, let's pull up the Argentine peso. Uh, when you have a currency, then basically it can go uh, parabolic and uh, then just stay there. And you can see that's what happened with the Argentine peso. Uh, it went parabolic here. That's when you think you would crash. No, it just drifted uh, worthless, even more worthless. And then it had another parabolic move. It actually looks like it's setting up for another parabolic move. That's because currencies can go to zero. They're different than markets, which ultimately become too expensive currencies can just be printed into nothing. So that's pretty much the only exception to the rule of uh, parabolic markets crashing. So we're in a situation where we have endless debt. They're piling it on. The U.S. government just put on the third largest increase in the debt in good economic times. Um, the Vancouver real estate market, the U.S. real estate market, the stock markets, all these markets are going up and it's all based on endless debt and it's going to come crashing down. We just don't know when. And we'll talk to you next time.